So it's just a quick hello to those of you who have joined. Um, we're still a few minutes away before we start. Our, our speaker is here. She's just getting herself a glass of water. So um, welcome and uh, we'll do the kind of start the program around about seven o'clock. So thanks for being here. We have people trickling in, Michelle, so I'll start on time because I think um, P 
people will be coming in while I'm talking and so they won't mind missing what I have to say. So that'll be all right. <laughs> that works for me. Okay, good. Yeah, I think we're all getting used to this online side of things and so um uh it's kind of still kind of strange we did have a speaker yeah. um who didn't want to speak online she'd rather wait until it was in person so um yeah i definitely prefer in person so, but um i just got a question in the chat from edgar and um asking if this will be posted oh, my internet connection is on so edgar's asking if this will be posted somewhere for people to watch later. So yes, the, we record our talks and we actually have, a, we're still working on transitioning from our old YouTube channel to a new one, but there'll be links available on the RSI website, which is rsi.rice.edu. Um, so hopefully uh, Edgar, that answers your question. So yeah, th these will be available. And um, all of our previous talks as well are available. Um, if you're interested, you can you can dig up some of those. Um, uh, in fact, you can even we, what we should probably do is is even though they're, they're arranged chronologically, we should probably arrange them by theme because um, we've had a couple of talks on what happens in the space station. Not quite, not none none focusing on on what um, Michelle's going to focus on, but uh, I think if you put some of those things together, you end up with a really good picture of all of the stuff that NASA's doing. Um, we had Grace Douglas talk about food. Um, we've had John Charles talk about the twin study and things like that. So there's a whole collection of stuff, I think, um, around our friends at Johnson and, and what's going on at the space station, I think. So we should probably start putting them together and categorize them by theme as well as chronologically. So. And Michelle, in person, we usually get our speakers to sign the posters with these posters, which we have a to put a video gallery together of them so at some point we might try and see if we can get a digital signature on that for um, for you to sign okay that'd be great um maybe once i get in the office no it would be great for i mean as i said it's a nice we've actually got them all stored in the office but there's about 60 of them now and there are these foam boards so they're taking up a lot of space and we don't have we don't have the wall space to put them on so we we scanned i think we've got we the we were up at about 50 something when we scanned them so we've got about another half dozen to scan to keep up to date and but the nice thing is that most of them are signed uh, the only one is we had alan bean uh, who was the fourth person on the moon um his poster was stolen oh no he, we after, unfortunately after we had him, after we had him sign it um somebody walked away with it because we left it outside the auditorium but Oh, well, oh, you know, we can't even trust rice students or rice <laughs> people. So. All right, well, let's let's just get get the show on the road. People will be, be coming in. So um, I want to thank everybody who's who's here already and um, uh, welcome you to our second in the in this the fall semester's uh, Spaceport Frontier Lecture Series. Um, we have two more planned uh, for this semester, and then I'll start working um, on next semester. Our next one will be, I think it's October, uh, this is October, November 5, Guy Fox Night, if you're British. Um, and so that will be uh, astronaut Serena Onan Chancellor, who I'm sure Michelle knows well and has worked with a lot. Um, yep. So as a, a, a medical professional and doctor, and so there'll be a kind of be a relative relative connection um and what we're, we're talking about then again uh and i've forgotten the dates it's december i think it's that first thursday in december uh we will have um a professor from arizona state talking about the um social political impacts of settlement settling mars or colonizing mars and what language you should use and so on so that would be kind of interesting i'm waiting for their official titles before i send out the information that's why you haven't heard 
uh, from me about that. I did request it from everyone um, last week or two weeks ago, and I haven't heard back from them all yet. Anyway, um, so again, I also have to thank our sponsors, which is the Houston Spaceport, um, uh, the Houston Airport Systems, and the Houston Spaceport at Ellington Field with Arturo Machuca. Um, normally, that sponsorship allows us to provide you all with some nice food and drink. Um, so I'm afraid you're going to have to provide your own. I apologize for that, but we'll, we'll get back to normal someday. Um, and I think, uh, let's see, is there any other announcements? One thing I wanted to say was um, we have uh, a new crew going up to Space Station. I'm not sure if Michelle will touch on that, um, including a friend of ours who you've, you've seen at some of our talks, um, Kate Rubens. And um, by the end of the month, we'll have Shannon Walker going up um, and Shannon got all of her three degrees from Rice University. So, um, and like my son, she played French horn. Uh, she played it in the marching L band and refuses. I did a musical thing with her one time and she refuses to play again. But uh, anyway, she'll be going up as part of the SpaceX Crew 1 yeah. mission. Um, and so we're kind of excited about that. So thanks for, again for being here. Um, let me introduce tonight's speaker. Michelle and I met at the International Space Medicine Summit, which is always a fantastic event um, and it's a for me it's just kind of I'm a fly on the wall at these things but for Michelle it's like what she knows what she does who she works with and all these great things so I'm really pleased to have her tonight um, and be part of this series uh, so Michelle is the uh, program manager for human health and performance contract uh, for KBR um, uh, which is basically manages all of the, the astronaut the biomedical engineering all of the things to do with the human spaceflight program on the on the kind of personal side, the biology side, and the people um, at the Johnson Space Center, um, which is a big part of of, of uh, the management of the Johnson Space Center, uh, and that supports all of the human spaceflight missions uh, to uh, the station. She's a proud alumnus or alumna of Vanderbilt University, uh, and mm -hmm. she's been. I guess you've been in Houston since you started with KBR back a few years ago. Um, last century, I guess it was, right, 1999. Yeah. But she well, started as a flight controller focusing. That's, listen, that's young. That's, that's compared to, I've, I've been in the US now since 1993, so I've been here a long time. Um, <clears throat> she started as a flight controller focusing on the medical operations on the shuttle, um, and then, of course, the space station. Uh, and she's co chaired, and this is like one of the longest. Uh, acronyms that NASA, as far as I know, has produced. She co-chaired the Commercial Space Transportation Advisory Council Re Reusable Launch Vehicle Working Group Task Force on Training. And if you could have made that spelled a word, that would have been pretty cool. Uh, and as part of this task force, it basically they put together a bunch of um, guidelines and training and standards for uh, for how you uh, you uh, conduct space operations. So she has co-authored the Commercial Human Space Operations Training Standards. Um, she served as a flight and medical operations department manager for many years and uh, basically looking, taking the that KBR staff and GSE staff, the 300 or so people, to uh, basically uh, help with crew and uh, ground medical operations, radiator radiation operations, um, medical project implementation on the space station and so on. Um, locally and nationally, she's been involved in a lot of the professional organizations and the National Management Association and is a past president of the Space Medicine Association of the Aerospace Medicine Association. So lots of um, uh, experience, lots of expertise, lots of knowledge in something that's really important to the space program and in particular to us here in Houston. So with that, Michelle, um, I'll let you take control and share your screen. And oh, sorry, I should say that um, please send your, there's a Q&A button on your screen. If you put in your questions at any time on there, um, if, it, if, it, if it's a timely question, I may ask, or Michelle, would you prefer to have the questions at the end or do you prefer to be interrupted? Either is fine. I'm happy to be interrupted if it's relevant. Well, if, if I can judge if it's relevant, I might interrupt you if that's okay. And in, in the Q&A session, if depending on the questions, what I might, okay, thank you. What I might do is unmute you, but that worked well the last time, and I'll unmute you and allow you to ask Michelle your question directly. So don't be shy, uh, get those questions in. So Michelle, over to you. Thank you. Great. 
Well, thank you. I really appreciate the kind introduction, Dr. Alexander. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pull my slides up just so they're ready. So it is really my pleasure to be here tonight and appreciate the opportunity to talk to you about something I'm very passionate about. Um, as you heard, I work for KBR as the program manager for the human health and performance contract. Um, so I am a, um, a contractor at NASA's Johnson Space Center. I've been there since about 1999. So full disclosure, I came down on the five-year plan and here I am over 20 years later. So I liked it and decided to stay. Um, so what you didn't hear is that I am not a physician and I'm also not a clinician. Um, in fact, I'm not even a PhD researcher who is looking at discovering the next important thing to understand what happens to the human body in microgravity. So you might already be thinking, well, why the heck are we sitting here listening to you tonight then? Well, what I'm really hoping to do is to take some time to pull back the curtain and look at the operational aspects of what goes into space medicine. So our clinicians and our physicians and our scientists are incredibly important, but without the logistics and the training and the procedures to back those things up, we would not be nearly as successful in space as we are today. So, and that's really what I'm gonna talk about this evening. So our operations experts take the time to make sure we have the equipment available, that we have the, um, the personnel at hand and the right resources at hand, and to make sure that everybody is trained to do the, the task in front of them. It's actually really a lot of fun, but a lot of it is quite behind the scenes. It's the things that you don't think about or most people don't think about when they think about spaceflight. Um, in fact, before I came here, I really didn't know that NASA and human spaceflight needed people like me. I thought everybody was an astrophysicist or a pilot or a physician. And so when I learned that there was this whole other aspect that goes into making spaceflight possible, it was really exciting to me to get to learn about that. So I'm hoping that tonight I'll get to show you a little bit of that, um, get to show you about the challenges of working in microgravity and how the operations team really takes and figures out how to make things work in microgravity with the right people, the right procedures, and the right processes. So I hope you'll stick with me. Um, hope if nothing else, maybe I can tell you a couple of fun stories tonight. Maybe you'll learn something new along the way and get to see some pretty pictures. But first, let me set the stage. I am going to really focus on the International Space Station tonight. So let's talk about the environment that we're operating in. So this is the International Space Station. It has been in continuous crewed operations since 2000. In fact, we are coming up on the 20th anniversary of that, um, the first crew to launch to the ISS. So the station travels at 17,500 miles per hour. For those of you trying to do the math, that's 4.76 miles per second. It orbits the Earth every about 90 minutes. So that's a sunrise and sunset every 90 minutes. And it's orbiting us at 250 miles up. When we launch a new crew to the station, it takes anywhere from six hours to two days for them to dock. It really depends on which um, docking procedure they are following. Crew size. Crew size is typically three to six people for six month stays. Now, many of you are probably aware that we've had several people stay on board the space station for much longer than six months, um, including Scott Kelly, Peggy Whitson, and Christina Cook most recently. It is an international crew. And um, this is where I would turn it over to the audience, but ask if anybody knows who the five member partners of the International Space Station are. Um, so that is the United States, the Russian Space Agency, the European Space Agency, the Japanese Space Agency, and the Canadian Space Agency. So the European Space Agency, or ESA, is made up of a group of member countries who participate in ESA. But all five are full member international um, space station program. So ISS, the habitable volume nowadays is actually quite big. It's about the size of a five bedroom house. So think about this, however long you've lived in your house or your apartment now, think about how much stuff you have accumulated in that time. And if it's been less than 20 years, think about how much stuff would have, will accumulate in the 20 years that will pass. Now, 
Think about the fact that every six months, there's a new group of people coming into the space station and folks are leaving stuff behind. So you can imagine that storage and understanding where all that stuff is, is incredibly important. So it's a very unique environment. Um, obviously we have microgravity, that's the primary reason why we're there. It's also a closed loop system, which prevent, presents some unique challenges. It is a radiation environment. So a lot of people don't realize that astronauts are actually considered radiation workers. So we follow what's called the ALARA principle, which is as low as reasonably achievable. So we do monitor their radiation dosage and we try to make sure that we keep their, um, the dose that they receive while on the space station as low as is reasonable given the work that they need to do while they're up there. It operates at a normal pressure environment, so 14.7 PSI, what you and I are experiencing right now. Operates at normal temperature and humidity. And it operates at normal gas percentages. So um, you can tell though from some of these statistics, the fact that it's 250 miles up, that it takes between six hours to two days to dock, that doing things like house calls is not really a realistic expectation. As far as I know, the Maytag man does not go to space station yet. And much to the chagrin of a lot of our flight surgeons, they also don't get to do house calls yet. So part of what I'm gonna focus on today is talking about how we prepare for that and how we make sure that the crew is trained for that. That way, if somebody gets sick or something is broken and we need to fix it, we already have the tools and supplies in place to take care of it. Another unique aspect of the ISS is the crew lives and works in the same space, much like many of us have been doing for the last six months during COVID. Um, so that, you know, think about it. If you um, were to go to work and your work environment is very noisy, which the space station is quite noisy, it's something we have to think about when we design new hardware. Can we make the pumps quieter? Can we make the fans quieter? How do we make sure that we are keeping that as quiet as possible? How do we make sure the crew's wearing the right hearing protection? But on, on the ground, if your work environment is very noisy, well, after eight hours, you get to go home to a quiet environment. The crew, not so lucky. Um, they are living and working in the same space. Um, thankfully, during COVID, we have been able to at least go outside and get some fresh air. Our astronauts, they don't really get that opportunity. So here is where I would really work in some um, audience participation. So I'm gonna go ahead and go through these questions anyway, so you can answer them to yourself and um, feel free to tell your friends and neighbors that you got them all right. Uh, but first, here is a look at what the inside of the International Space Station looks like. So this is one of the modules. And you can see how much equipment is inside that module. Um, so people say, you know, they don't understand how things can get lost or misplaced. Um, but imagine if that was your work environment and you are getting ready to do an experiment or you're getting ready to fix something, um, you've got to make sure you know where things are and where things go and they get back in the right place because it would be very easy to quickly lose track of something. Okay, so how much do you know? Are there people in space right now? Yes. How many people are on ISS right now? Three. Which countries are represented on ISS right now? Well, right now, that's the US and Russia. If this uh, talk was a week from now, these numbers would be very different because as David already uh, pointed out, Kate Rubens is getting ready to launch to the space station next week. So in the event of an emergency, how does the crew get home? Well, right now the crew would come home on a Soyuz. Um, it is always maintained that every person on board the space station has a seat home in an emergency vehicle. Now that um, SpaceX is flying at the space station, we'll have, those crew members will be able to come home on SpaceX. But right now, if the crew had to leave tomorrow, they would get in the Soyuz and come home. Is there always a doctor on ISS? Hmm, what do you think? A lot of people think yes, but no, there is not always a doctor on ISS. Although in your next lecture, you're gonna to get to hear from a very talented doctor who was on ISS. That will be a real treat to hear from Serena. How much medical training does the crew get? Okay, well, if there's not a doctor on ISS, they must get a fair amount of medical training, right? Well, here's how much medical training the crew gets. 
So our CMOs or crew medical officers, those are the guys you're going to go see if you're on the space station and you bump your head, your back, you have back pain, you've got something going on. Um, you're going to go see your crew medical officer. They get 25 hours approximately of medical training prior to launching to the space station. Everybody else on the crew gets 12 hours. So I used to always like to tell people to make sure that you are really nice to your crew medical officer because if you need something from them, you're going to want to get it. And um, I think in that 25 hours, we still do about 30 minutes of dental training. So heaven forbid, you'd have to have some dental training done by somebody that's had 30 minutes of dental training. You would want to make sure that your crew medical officer was doing everything possible to make sure you were very numb before they went in and did anything. Of course, with Space Station right now, we have the luxury of really good uh, communication coverage. So the crew can also call down and work with their flight surgeon that's on the ground. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that later when I get into talking about ultrasound and how we use that. So, okay, so I said three people were on ISS right now, so let's, let's see who they are. So this is the current ISS crew. So you have Chris Cassidy, Anatoly Ivanishin, Yvonne Wagner, and they launched in April. They launched April 9th of this year from the Baikonur Cosmodrome. And you can also see their crew patch. So probably most everybody on this call knows this, but each, each crew gets to design their own mission patch. Um, normally they put in some things that have a lot of meaning to either them or the period of time in their mission patch. And so you can see this crew's mission patch there in the bottom left. Uh, they really designed their patch to have a look at um, the crossroads of the past and the future. Um, if you'll notice, hopefully you can see there are 13 stars that are brighter than the rest on their patch. And those 13 stars actually represent Apollo 13 because during their mission was the um, 50th anniversary of the Apollo 13 uh, mission. So kind of neat tying that into their mission patch, but it's a pretty cool thing. Um, really neat to see mission patches and understand what's behind them and why the crew designed them the way that they did. And FYI, for anyone who is interested, you can opt this um, snapshot that shows the three crew members with their names and where they're from is actually available on the nasa.gov website. So you can go out there and find it. It'll also show you their mission patch and give you some information about the patch. So in case you didn't know it was out there, there's some resources. Okay, so I get asked all the time, we fly really healthy crew members, don't we? So why do we even need a human health and performance program? Aren't these guys the best of the best? They launch, they're fine, we don't have to worry about them. Well, we do. We do fly really healthy crew members, and that is something that we are fortunate that we've had the luxury of being able to select really healthy people to fly in space. But the human body is really designed for, um, for being in a gravitational field. We're really designed for 1G. And so some interesting things happen. Um, now, as an aside, I will mention, I think that this is a really um, exciting time to be a part of aerospace medicine. And the reason for that is as more commercial companies come online and they start flying more paying passengers, um, we're going to see that shift. You know, the paying passengers maybe aren't going to be the same um, specimen when it comes from a health standpoint as the astronauts that we currently fly. So it's going to be really interesting to see how we adapt and deal with some of those things um, and see some unique pathologies fly that haven't flown in the past. So yes, we fly really healthy people, but like I mentioned, we are really designed to be in um, a 1G environment. So let's look at some of the things that we worry about from a human system risk standpoint. Um, and our goal is we want to keep those folks as healthy as possible when they get to the space station so that they can do the job that they need to do while they're up there, but then also help make sure that they are healthy when they come home so that they can recover and possibly either fly again or go on to do whatever the next chapter of their life may bring. So some of the human system risks that we really worry about for space exploration are things like I just mentioned, the altered gravity and the physiological changes that come with that. Um, so that first one that's listed there is space flight associated neuroocular syndrome, which is quite a mouthful. Um, so that is talking about some of the vision changes we've seen in space flight in our astronaut population. We see things like balance disorders, fluid shifts, cardiovascular deconditioning, muscle atrophy and bone loss because you're in a gravitational environment. You don't have the constant force of gravity pushing down on you like I, I'm standing right now. So right now I have the benefit of having um, gravity pushing down on me. Space radiation, um, we worry about acute in-flight effects. Remember I said astronauts are radiation workers. We also worry about the long-term cancer risk. We're concerned about the distance from Earth. 
um, especially as we go beyond low Earth orbit. You know, right now on the space station, we can get home pretty quickly if we need to. We can call down and have great communication coverage and talk to a flight surgeon or talk to an expert on the ground if we need to. But as we go farther and farther from Earth, uh, this is gonna become a bigger issue. So how do we help the crew be more autonomous? You know, they can't come home for treatment. They maybe can't even call back to home for treatment and something has to be done right away. How do we give them the tools that they need and make sure that they have the right equipment on board to take care of what they need to take care of? It's also a hostile enclosed environment. So we worry about impacts from that. Um, we worry about environmental impacts. Uh, CO2 levels are listed there. This is kind of an interesting case where early in the space station development, we had come up with a requirement for what the CO2 levels needed to be on space station. There really aren't any good analogous requirements we could use on the ground beyond the, uh, they, they use some data from the submarine population. But once we started flying for quite a long time, we realized that that CO2 level was too high and it actually needed to be lowered. So it seemed showing the importance of continuing to do the research and continuing to study what's going on. It also meant it led to some very challenging discussions about how to use the hardware. The hardware was designed for a certain level of CO2 and now we needed it to work that much harder. So the closed loop environment is a very real issue that we worry about. And then isolation and confinement. So the behavioral aspect of isolation, you know, for the last six months, there has been a lot of talk about that. There have also been a lot of to have flown to the space station about how to deal with isolation and confinement as people were hunkering down and staying home during the COVID pandemic. And then sleep disorders. Um, how well are people gonna be able to sleep? How well do they sleep now? How well they, will they sleep when they get further beyond low earth orbit? So lots of things to worry about. And then those are the risks, but these are the actual physiologic changes that we actually see due to space flight. So we see things like decreased bone mineral content and decreased bone mineral, mineral density with an increase in urinary calcium and an increase in renal stone risk. So something like a kidney stone could actually be mission ending for somebody. So that's a very uh, concerning event. We also see a decrease in skeletal muscle mass and skeletal muscle strength, skeletal muscle endurance, and skeletal muscle density. So think about you're sending a crew now out to the moon or to Mars. Uh, when we land crews here back on Earth, there's a whole team of people waiting to pick them up and help them get out of their capsule, move them over to the helicopters, and help them readapt back to 1G. When our crews in the future get to Mars, there's not going to be a greeting party waiting for them. So how do we prepare them um, for all of these issues they're going to encounter? And we're using station right now to help us understand some of those things to come. So we also worry about neurosense, that we see neurosensory changes, we see vestibular disturbances, we see space motion sickness. Uh, so most of our first time flyers experience space motion sickness. Most astronauts, up to 60 to 70 percent, experience space motion sickness. For most people, it subsides within 72 hours, but not everybody. So um, imagine just feeling sort of nauseous or actually throwing up. Now imagine throwing up in microgravity. Um, so serious issues that we need to contend with. Um, it's part of the reason why we usually, we don't do spacewalks very early in a crew member's mission to make sure that they can adapt and will be over all of their space motion sickness symptoms. Um, what's interesting is um, we really can't correlate who will get space motion sickness to things on the ground. So just because you get motion sick in a car on the ground does not mean that you will definitely get SMS when you fly and vice versa, so. Uh, we see changes in sensory motor function and uh, postural and locomotor stability. We also see cardiovascular changes, and there have been a lot of studies in the recent years about cardiovascular changes we are seeing, including changes in fluid volume, a decrease in orthostatic tolerance, a decrease in aerobic capacity, and an increase in arrhythmias. And then other changes we see are psychosocial, so team issues, confinement issues, fatigue, stress, an increase in errors, uh, which can all lead to a decrease in cognitive function. And then some environmental changes as well. So we see hearing loss. Again, remember I said station is a very loud environment. Uh, we see an increase in radiation exposure, um, which leads to an increased risk of cataracts and cancers, and an increase in skin irritations due to microbial growth. 
So these are all the issues that our clinicians and scientists are trying to combat. So getting back to why I'm here, you can see that it's important we make sure everybody has the tools they need. So, okay, well, those are the things that happen, but how do we stay healthy in space? Well, here on Earth, you would eat right. You'd hopefully breathe clean air, hopefully drink clean water, get some exercise, have a good balance between work and play, get enough sleep as we're learning more and more that's critical to a healthy lifestyle, and go to the doctor when you're sick. So how do we stay healthy in space? Well, surprise, surprise, we need to eat right, we need to breathe clean air, we need to drink clean water, we need to get some exercise, more exercise. We need to have a good balance between work and play. We need to make sure we're getting sleep. And we need to call the doctor when, when you're sick. So instead of going to the doctor, you might call the doctor instead, because remember, we probably or we may not have a doctor on board the space station with you. So eating right, um, here on the ground, you know, you might, if you don't like what you have in your pantry or your refrigerator, you might run down to the grocery store or decide you're gonna go out to eat. Well, our crew members can't do that. So we have to make sure that we pre-position the right food for them. And they do get to taste their menus before they fly. But interestingly enough, your taste buds actually change when you're in space. So something that tasted good to you on the ground before you flew may not taste so great once you get up in flight. Hey, Michelle. Yeah. Um, before you go on to the physiological thing, we have a question um, from Bill, who um, is asking, um, well, he says, whenever I see NASA videos of astronauts on the space station, I don't hear noise in the background. Why not? One of the things you said was that background uh, environment that they're having to deal with. So since you're going on to the physiology, I thought this might be a good place to ask that question before you go away yeah. from it. Yeah, that's a great question. And you know, I don't have a good answer for you. Um, I can tell you that I have seen some videos from the space station that are more engineering operational videos where you can hear how loud it is in the background. So, um, you know, that's a good question that I need to go research. I don't know if it's a setting that they use to help um, sort of block out some of the background noise, because you're right, when you see them in public affairs events and things, you really don't hear, you really don't hear how loud it is. Yeah, there's, probably, there's, probably some, there's probably some directional microphones or, or somebody down in mission control filtering everything because you want to hear the astronauts. Could be, could be. But, you know, one of the things I always um, tried to really ingrain in our, in our newer folks is if you don't know the answer, just be up front and say, I don't know, but I can go find out. Right. Um, but that, that is probably a very reasonable, um, reasonable thing is directional microphones. Interesting question. Made me think. I like it. Thanks, Bill. Okay, so um, talking more about food. So food is really important, both physically and psychologically for people um, being able to sit down to a meal that tastes good, but is also um, healthy for you. But, um, you know, think about food in space. So if we, if here on the ground, if you're going to add salt to something, you're going to shake it out of your salt shaker and it's going to sprinkle onto your food, but that's not going to happen in space. You're going to shake it out of your salt shaker and it's going to disperse and get into the filters. So we have to think about those things and we have to think about how to package things. Um, since the astronauts can't run to the grocery store every week, we also have to think about how to package the food so it stays um, healthy and safe for them to eat for a long period of time. We also want to make sure that we have enough pre-positioned so that they have at least, if a cargo vehicle doesn't make it, they have enough food to eat until the next one arrives. So interesting things to think about. Um, Related to food is it seems like we never have enough coffee on board, <laughs> so we always need to fly more coffee. So your um, need for caffeine does not go away once you fly to the space station. So, uh, Which leads me to uh, drinking clean water, because as we like to say, we like to turn today's coffee into tomorrow's coffee. So all of the resources on the space station are incredibly precious. And so we do recycle and reclaim um, all of the condensate and all of the uh, urinary waste on board space station. So your coffee today becomes tomorrow's coffee. So you can see why it's really important that we do things like monitor the water 
and have the right equipment up there to do that and monitor the air. All right, so let's talk a little bit about exercise. So if I walk into a gym, first of all, my, my uh, bicycle I'm gonna ride probably doesn't look like this and my treadmill I'm gonna run on probably doesn't look quite like that. But I could probably hop on a treadmill and operate it and make it work and, and get a good workout in. I could probably even take it apart if somebody asked me to take it apart. It might take me a while, I might break some things, I might get frustrated, but I'm not sure I could put it back together and make it run. So these are all things we ask of our crew members is they have to know how to operate the equipment, they have to know how to diagnose it when it is um, malfunctioning, and they have to know how to put it back together. Now, a big part of that is using your resources. We, there are very few things that we expect them to have memorized. Those are reserved for emergencies, but they need to be familiar with the hardware and familiar with the techniques to be able to appropriately understand what's going on, appropriately use the hardware, and be able to take it apart, put it back together, and fix it if needed. So, this is where our operations specialists on the ground come in and are extremely important. They need to understand the hardware even better, how it works, how is it likely to break. Um, they need to make sure that they are documenting things very clearly in procedures, because as we'll talk about a little bit later when I talk about, it might have been a year since the last time this crew member saw this piece of hardware. Now with exercise equipment, since it's so important to what they do and so important that they exercise, they get a fair amount of time with the exercise hardware on the ground before they launch. Um, this picture of the treadmill hanging on the wall is one I like to use because it also highlights the fact that um, we really can't mimic running in microgravity with a normal treadmill here on the ground. So we had to come up with a way to, um, to mimic that and understand how it's actually functioning and the benefits it's having on the human body for somebody who has, um, if you, you aren't standing up and running on a treadmill in the traditional fashion. And I don't know about you guys, but um, any home improvement project at my house requires at least three trips to Home Depot. Again, they don't have that luxury, so we have to make sure that we really understand what might break, how it might break, and how they might need to fix it. Uh, and make sure that all of those items are pre-positioned on board on the space station and that they're correctly called out in the procedure. Because you can probably imagine, thinking back to that picture a few slides ago, if I sent you off to try to find various pieces of equipment um, in order to fix the treadmill that you wanted to run on and you had an hour to do it, um, how frustrating it would be if I was sending you to the wrong location to gather the tools you needed. So again, really important for us to understand where the tools are, how we're going to use them, and how the crew's going to use them. So let's talk a little bit about medical kits. So my first aid kit at home doesn't look like this. Maybe yours does. Hopefully the first thing that jumps out at you is the red in the kits on the right. So the red is really used to highlight to the crew that this is a kit that we would use in the event of an emergency. Again, it's that visual cue that, hey, I've got a medical emergency going on. This is the kit that I wanna grab. This is the one that's going to have the supplies I really need to get the job done. So we use things like that um, as we're developing hardware, as we're developing procedures to give the crew cues as to um, where they need to be, what they need to get, those kinds of things. Some other interesting things about the medical kits and medication management. So here on the ground, I need an Advil. So I open my bottle and I shake out the, shake out the pills. Um, I pop them in my mouth and I'm ready to go. Well, again, think about on station, if I fly just a traditional bottle of Advil and I open the lid and I, I try to shake out my one pill, um, the rest of them are gonna go flying and I'm gonna lose them. And they're gonna go flying up into the vents and into the filters and all kinds of things. So uh, we also, uh, so we do have a, a pharmacy and our chief pharmacist always says the least important thing they do is prescription, is write prescriptions because they help to understand which medications we should fly, which ones the crew needs, and also keep track of how long have those meds been up there so we can make sure that um, we trash them and dispose of them when needed. That means having a really good relationship with the pharmaceutical suppliers to make sure that we get the medications with the longest expiration date possible. Because remember, we're gonna have to get these medications, package them, 
and then ship them up to the station where they're gonna be there for use for a while. So we wanna make sure that the medications are safe for the crew to use. Also, just because the medications fly in space doesn't get us out of any paperwork. So when we are done with our medications, typically they will burn up on reentry um, with other trash in a progress vehicle. And so any controlled substances that we have flown to the space station that we trash because we didn't need them and don't need them, we still have to do all the required paperwork to make sure that um, the uh, federal agencies are well informed. It, so just being in space doesn't get you out of all that regulatory paperwork. Okay, so I wanna take a deep dive for a few minutes into looking at the ultrasound. And so what I'm gonna to try to do here is really highlight, use the ultrasound as a case study to show how many of the operational things come together to really make the system work. So I think the ultrasound will, will be a good case study to take a look at that. So the ultrasound is re a really important device in our telemedicine capability. It's used for both research activities, things like looking at the changes in fluids on orbit and in fluid shifts, it's also used for things like medical operations. It could be looking at um, changes in the shape of the eyeball, or it could be actually used to diagnose something. You know, maybe I've got some um, pelvic discomfort. And can we use the ultrasound to try to see what's going on? So it is used for a variety of activities, and it is our only medical imaging capability on the space station. So we don't have an MRI, we don't have an X-ray machine. We use the ultrasound which has actually led us to be able to come up with some very creative and novel ways to use the ultrasound. Um, in a lot of ways that it wasn't being used on the ground. Uh, we actually pioneered with some, um, with some collaborators to use uh, the ultrasound in space on orbit in some really unique ways. So this ultrasound here is actually what we call a COTS or commercial off the shelf piece of hardware. Um, but that it has been uh, modified and we have developed some attachments to go with it. So just like any other piece of hardware, the ultrasound itself has to go through a variety of tests before it flies to the space station. And the reason I bring this up is because we often get asked, hey, you guys are using outdated technology. Why don't you use this latest and greatest, whatever it might be, that has just come out. You should just fly that to the space station and use that instead. It's a much better piece of equipment. Well, for most things, we have to go through a pretty rigorous flight certification process. So that means we have to understand, can the piece of equipment actually handle the vibration loads it's going to experience on launch? Um, can it withstand things uh, like being in the radiation environment? What's gonna happen if it's exposed to vacuum? Um, is it gonna off gas any toxins into the environment? If it's sitting out in the space station and it gets kicked, uh, is it still gonna work? because it is, it costs about $10,000 for every pound of equipment that we fly to the space station. So you don't wanna fly something that gets up there and isn't gonna work. Uh, you wanna make sure that it's pretty hardy and rugged and, and is going to be able to work. So we have to put all this equipment through a variety of activities to make sure that it can withstand the rigors of space flight. Uh, for the ultrasound itself, uh, we can downlink data but the data actually goes through Marshall Space Flight Center before it comes over and is routed to Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. Uh, we can downlink both still images and we can downlink video images and it takes you know, 15 minutes or so to download about 350 megabytes. But that meant that we had to figure out all of those routings and how to make sure we got the data securely because this is medical data. So we need to make sure it's secure when it comes down and it's secure when it comes over to Johnson Space Center. Um, oftentimes the downlink data we use is for to analyze after the fact. Keep in mind too that the ultrasound will be used for minimally by minimally trained individuals. So remember we don't always have a physician on board. That's why it's really important that we develop clear and concise procedures for the ground to use um, as to, or excuse me, for the crew to use as to how to use the hardware how to troubleshoot anything that's going on and how to fix it if they need to. Um, and clear, concise language is really important to make sure, making sure that we are giving them all the steps necessary. You know, if I walked into a doctor's office and they asked me to use the ultrasound machine there without anything, I, I certainly wouldn't be able to do it, let alone be able to fix it. So you can see um, 
how important it is that our operations team really develops those step-by-step -step procedures for the crew to use. Um, you'll also notice we try to do some other things though to make it easy for them. So you'll notice uh, in this picture of the ultrasound keyboard, it's pretty colorful. So that is not what your ultrasound is going to look like when you walk into your doctor's office. But again, it's all to help make sure that we get what we need in, a, in the most efficient manner possible. So it's much easier to tell the crew, hey, I need you to, do, to go to purple two and hit the up button, or I need you to hit the green three button, than it is if that color coding wasn't there, trying to help navigate them to the right button to push. So remember, the person operating this might be a fighter pilot, they might be a mechanical engineer, they might be somebody who hated biology and life sciences and became an engineer because they wanted nothing to do with that stuff. Um, so you gotta make sure that we're, we are prepared for that. Okay, so we got our ultrasound certified, flight certified. We've gotten it on board space station, so we're ready to go, right? Everything's set? Well, not so fast. So doing any activities on board the space station takes a tremendous amount of coordination and pre-planning on the ground prior to doing them. We have a lot of constraints we have to work around and we'll walk through what a few of those look like for a couple of minutes. So some of the operational constraints we deal with are time, communication availability, competing priorities, and then microgravity itself. So let's, Let's look at time and um, communication for a minute here. So this is an actual snapshot of the cruise day. This one is actually quite old. I took it from a while back, but it's a very good representation of a typical day on the space station. So the, uh, the time line is the, the top graph that you're seeing there. And each one of those six lines represents what that an individual crew member. So the top line is showing you what that individual crew member was scheduled for during the day and how quickly and how often and how tightly controlled their schedule is. So you can see there is very little slop in the schedule. There's very little white space. So there isn't always time available to get the activities in that you want done or that you think you need done. So crew time is a really precious resource. So we need to make sure we make the most of it when we do get it. Um, so if you have an activity that is supposed to last 20 minutes, you better make sure it can be done in 20 minutes. Otherwise, you have just messed up the rest of the day for, and you're messing up somebody else's activity or experiment that they were planning on being done and potentially have a lot of extra resources called in to help support that activity. You know, conversely, if your activity, if you can get it done in 15 minutes and give five minutes back to the crew, that's great, but you also don't wanna pad your schedule by too much and always have um, too much extra leftover. So this is why it's really important that our operations experts know the procedures, have practiced them, they have a good understanding of how long it's really gonna take. We really have a good understanding of where all the equipment is. We are asking the crew to go gather and bring it back to make sure that we can fit within the timeline. Another important operational constraint is the communication availability. So I won't go into all of the technical details about the satellites that we use, but our telemedicine and ultrasound concept of operations really relies on good communication and it relies on being able to get live video down both of the ultrasound itself and of the setup that the crew is using. So in order to do that, we have to have the right communication capability available. We need something, we need both S-band and KU-band to be able to do this. Make sure that that allows us to make sure we can talk with the crew and get the images that we need to make sure that this is successful. Um, really makes a big difference. In the early days of ultrasound operations, we actually only got the images of the ultrasound machine. We didn't get the images of the setup of the crew um, and how they were how they were holding the probe, but having both images really helps us because if the crew is having a hard time getting an image, we can give them some tips about body positioning, how to hold the probe, as well as how to make sure that they themselves are restrained appropriately to get the right image. But again, this is all private, so we have to make sure that this data and these videos come down in a private restricted fashion and they get shipped over to Johnson Space Center and into a back room with our specialists um, where they are watching the data. 
So that means you have to make sure that your crew member is available. And in the case of ultrasound, it's usually a crew member and somebody assisting them. So you have to have both people available as well as the right communication um, assets available in order to do this activity before you can timeline it. So really a, a, a big puzzle to fit everything in. You know, of course, we like to think that everything we do in human health and performance is the most important activity that anybody is doing that day on space station. But, you know, let's let's be honest, something like the toilet breaks and that is going to take precedence over whatever you might have been doing or had planned to do. So you just have to be flexible. Flexibility is a big key to what we do. We might have an entire team pulled in to support an activity and it just doesn't go that way. We do compete with a lot of other activities. So we have to deal with competing priorities quite frequently. So it might be the competing priority of another research experiment. It might be a major mission objective, like an, an extravehicular activity or a spacewalk to fix something outside the ISS or install something new that has just been brought up. Or it might be competing with our own internal human health and performance priorities. We might need to fix and install the treadmill. So what's more important? What's the higher priority to us? And how are we gonna fit all of those objectives in? So when I think about this, I really think about the, it being the ultimate logic puzzle where Susie can't sit next to Sally, but has to sit next to Fred on Tuesdays when they have pizza and you've got to get all of the constraints in just right and everybody in the right place. Um, there are quite a few constraints that do go into scheduling because for instance, take the treadmill. Um, there are quite a few activities that you cannot run on the treadmill while that activity is being done. For instance, if somebody is actually moving the station arm, uh, we can't have anybody running on the treadmill. So that's another constraint you have to take into account when you're scheduling activities is making sure that those things are deconflicted. Michelle? So think, yes. Sorry to interrupt. Um, <clears throat> we do have a couple of questions that are being saved for later, but there's one that came in, and I don't know if you're going, going to go on to address this, but it's, um, and I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing the name right, but uh, Sal Hua. Um, can you give a couple of examples of what what the ultrasound is used for? Okay, sure. If that, if that fits in with your scheme, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we use the ultrasound for a variety of things. So again, we use it for some research, research experiments. We use it to look at um, blood flow through uh, the veins in space because we do see um, fluid shifts. We see, so... Um, when astronauts first get to the space station, one of the things you might notice is their faces look very puffy. Sometimes they look red. So we see a fluid shift of all that fluid coming headward when they first get to space station until they move into, they, um, they lose some of that fluid, they diurese a little bit of it and become space flight normal, which would actually on the ground be a bit dehydrated. And here's where I'm getting into that. I'm not a doctor, I probably shouldn't talk about that territory. But so some of the things we have done is use the ultrasound to actually look at blood flow in space flight. We found some very some pretty interesting things that way. Um, we have done things for um, looking at things like um, uh, elimination of the bladder. So are we able to fully empty our bladder in space or not? Um, urinary retention is actually an issue we have dealt with on the um, in space several times to the point that we fly catheters and there have been crew members we have trained to self-catheterize. Um, other things that we use the space state of the ultrasound for is um, looking at the eye. Uh, we do some imaging of the back of the eyeball with the ultrasound, and we also um, and the, we have also used the ultrasound for musculoskeletal injuries or potential musculoskeletal injuries, or to see if we could use the ultrasound to look at musculoskeletal issues. So that was typically not something that the ultrasound on the ground was used for, but again, it's our only um, medical imaging capability. So some really novel things were developed to, to be able to use the ultrasound to look at some musculoskeletal issues in spaceflight. One of our great collaborators with that was a, a guy named Dr. Scott Dolchevsky, and he took some of those techniques and has actually used them um, with, the, um, with some Olympics teams and with the Detroit Red Wings um, as well. So great to see some of the things that we have developed in space actually translate back here on Earth. So those are a few things we've used it for. Hopefully that answers your question. If not, let me know and we can certainly get you some more data. All right. So I think we've talked about competing priorities. So let's talk about one of the biggest operational constraints of all. So microgravity, 
well, that seems kind of weird. How is that a constraint? Microgravity is the whole reason we're up there. Um, but it, it actually is. So um, think about it. If I, here on the ground, when we are doing something, we're used to being able to set my piece of paper and my pen on the table in front of me and it stays right there, right? Um, or it, if I push against you on the ground, nothing happens. But if I do that in space, you're going to go one direction and I'm going to go the other. And so we have to understand how to operate a microgravity to make sure that we understand that the procedures we're developing are gonna work and that the uh, crew will be able to do them. Uh, we need to understand how much longer something takes to do because we're in microgravity so that we can schedule it and timeline it appropriately, as well as develop some different techniques for doing things. So some of the pictures you can see here on the left is you can see us actually um, practicing doing CPR on the reduced gravity aircraft. So again, if I was going to do CPR here on the ground, I would put you on the ground and start compressions. Well, if I do that in the space station, if first of all, if I put you on the ground, unless I restrain you, you're not necessarily going to stay there. And if I start doing compressions, I'm going to fly the other direction. So we had to really come up with a way, hopefully we never need it, but we needed to come up with a way to be able to effectively do CPR in space. And so you can see actually the most effective method that we came up with was to do essentially a handstand on the individual's chest. And so you can see that being practiced on a dummy, on, again, on a reduced um, gravity aircraft, practicing that technique for doing CPR. The picture on the bottom is you can actually see the crew on the space station doing a, um, a drill to practice CPR. Now they are using a different method and you can see they actually have a towel rolled up on that um, board there to simulate the chest of the individual. Um, in this case, they have actually chosen one of the other methods, which is to wrap their legs under something to restrain themselves and give compressions that way. So that's another viable option. Um, so that while, I, while we're talking about that picture, I'll also point out that backboard there. That's the crew medical restraint system. And it's, um, again, here on the ground, if, if you were in my house and for some reason I needed to use a defibrillator, I would pull out the defibrillator, put the pads on, and the machine's gonna tell me whether or not I need to shock you. And I am not worried about that causing impact to any of my electrical equipment around me. Well, on the space station, if I was to do that, again, hopefully we never need it. But if I was to pull out the defibrillator and slap the pads on you, um, what kind of impact is that gonna to have to the, all of the important equipment on the space station around us? We can't afford to have that cause an impact to the rest of the equipment, especially the life support equipment up there. So that um, backboard also does provide some electrical isolation. So again, all of the, the things that might seem relatively minor, but are extremely important that you have to think about. Um, it's not as easy as just throwing somebody on board and, and saying have at it. Okay, so it's important to think about training. So we've touched a little bit on procedures. Um, we just talked about the microgravity impacts. But how are we going to train people for this environment and so they can be successful because that's what we really want and who are we training well we're training a wide variety of people we are training astronauts obviously we're training our flight surgeons uh, we're training a group of people we call our remote guiders and we're training our ground support team so remember just a couple of slides ago how packed the crew's on orbit timeline was well they start training about two years before they fly to the space station. And their days are pretty packed in those two years leading up to their flight to the space station. So they are just as busy with training before they fly as they are with activities once they get into flight. So for the ultrasound specifically, all astronauts get a 45 minute familiarization with the ultrasound uh, machine prior to flight. Now, keep in mind that familiarization might have been two years before they flew. So they maybe haven't seen that piece of equipment in over two years when they need to actually use it on the space station. They might also be somebody who really had no interest in learning how to do anything life sciences, human research related. Um, but we have found um, folks in the astronaut corps from all walks of life are really quite good at this. Um, even folks that thought maybe they, they weren't going to be very interested in it. They're very careful. They're very conscientious about learning the techniques and being able to do it well and do it right, which is fantastic. 
Um, same thing for folks who maybe we have to train them how to do a blood draw. You know, maybe they have been somebody who's always been squeamish about that stuff their whole life. And here I'm teaching them or our trainers are teaching them how to do a blood draw on somebody on orbit. Um, and actually, we have people on the ground who volunteer to be subjects so that the astronauts can practice uh, coming and sticking you and practice to make sure that they can get a good blood draw. Now, if an astronaut has signed up to actually participate in a research study that uses the ultrasound, they will get more training on the ultrasound. They might get one to two more hours of training on ultrasound and how to use it and some specific techniques. So, but keep in mind that's in comparison to hundreds of hours a professional ultrasonographer on the ground receives, maybe thousands of hours even, I should say. So I will um, share what I think is an interesting story. Um, a couple of years ago, I was at a conference and saw a gentleman that had a poster up that talked about using, I think he was a resident at the time, talked about using ultrasound to help guide some invasive procedures on the space station. Pretty interesting. So I stopped to have a chat with him and eventually the conversation got around to his concept of operations and how to actually make this operationally feasible. And so I asked him what his plan for training was. And he said, well, that's, that's easy. They would, um, the astronauts would have to come to me for six months and I would train them for six months and then they would be proficient and able to do this. And I kept trying to tell him that's not realistic. You're not gonna get six months of somebody's time. And I finally told, them, told him, hey, at best, you're gonna get you know, an hour, maybe two, to train them on this technique. So how are you gonna make that happen? And his response was, well, it's, it's impossible. You can't do that. Um, so that is what we do with training and with the operations community is to take what seems impossible because that's not how it's usually done on the ground. That's not how it's been done forever and figure out a way to make it feasible and make it happen. Um, so it just was an interesting, interesting story. It had nothing to do with um, his project or his intelligence or his desire, but it was just simply somebody who isn't in the operational community and doesn't understand all of the impacts and constraints we work with. So a lot of times we will work with the researchers um, to help make sure that they understand that what they're asking to do in flight isn't possible just because of the microgravity environment or the constraints and help them come up with something that is possible to do to help them still get the right science that they need. So for this, is it possible? Can we get what we need with minimally trained people? Well, yes, we can and we do. But again, that's really due to the quality of our procedures and the ground support team that is there to help them. So keep in mind, while the astronauts are going through medical operations training and they're getting some training on the ultrasound, they're also learning things like how to use their suits, how to maintain all of the station systems, and how to fly the vehicle. So they are just getting crammed with lots of information. So we can't expect them to remember everything we tell them in training. So we do try to give them some, some good handouts that talk about um, some of the tips and tricks we gave them during training that they can take with them, um, point out some of the safety aspects. Uh, for ultrasound specifically, they also have to know all of the camera angles and setups. So again, this is where our procedures are really important to make sure that they detail all of those things. Um, it's also a great opportunity to get feedback from the crew and um, another, I'll share another situation with you where for the ultrasound, you know, typically on the ground, you would use gel in order to help get the image. Well, the great thing about microgravity is if you take a bolus of water, it's going to stay right where you put it, unlike on the ground. Now remember, I said it's about $10,000 per pound to launch something to the space station. So if we don't have to launch ultrasound gel and can use water instead, that's a great savings. Well, what was interesting is we actually had a crew member come back and tell us that they really didn't want to use water, they wanted to use the gel. And it was because they had experienced when they were doing a, um, a scan on their eye that it burned and they thought it was the water that was burning. And so we said, oh, okay, well that, that shouldn't be happening. So we need to go figure out what's causing that. Well, come to find out that, um, you know, the crimber had cleaned the, the head of the ultrasound probe with the right cleaner and then had used it on their eye. And it was actually the cleaning fluid that was causing uh, the burning. Now, thankfully, you know, it, there wasn't much on there. It didn't cause any damage. But again, just goes back to the fact that the procedures need to be very clear. You know, wipe the head of the probe with the cleaner and then rinse with water to make sure that all of those steps are in there. 
So precise language is really important. And I will also share another story um, where that has come into play with the ultrasound as well. Um, so again, an eye scan, um, a particular eye scan where it's, it's important to not put too much pressure on the eyeball. So don't push down too hard as you're trying to get the scan of the eyeball. Um, and the language that we were using for that did, did not translate well into Russian. Um, and so we needed to make sure we found a way to communicate the concept with them to get the right scan. Um, while working with the interpreters, we came up with the fact that this, the concept of pulling away from the eyeball uh, was meaningful. And so we could talk about pulling the probe slightly away from the eyeball as opposed to light pressure um, meant something to them so we could get the right scan. So again, just goes back to can't assume that the words we're using are correct. We have to make sure and make sure that it makes sense to the crew since they're going to be the ones ultimately using the equipment. So um, our flight surgeons come to us already trained. You know, they're already physicians. We don't have to teach them how to be doctors, but we do have to teach them how to be physicians in this unique environment. So that is things like how to work with a primarily engineering community. Um, how to work with a patient that they can't see or touch, but they're going to have to talk them through something or talk to them about something um, and try to figure out what's going on when they can't physically see or touch them. How to make sure that they understand the limitations of the supplies that they have on board. You know, if, if they're an ER physician, they're used to having everything in a typical ER at their, um, at their beck and call. Well, they may not have all of those supplies um, readily available on the space station for the crew to use. So they need to understand what supplies are available, how the crew is trained, and what they can be expected to do. So again, we don't, we don't train the physicians as to how to be physicians, but we train them how to use the equipment that we have. We train them how to talk in this environment. So we like to say we translate sort of the typical traditional clinical training setting you see up there on the left into somebody who is able to work in mission control and um, be able to work effectively with the crew and get done what they need to get done. And for certain activities, we use the help of some ground support team. So I, I mentioned this concept of remote guiders earlier, but didn't really explain what that is. So we have found, especially with ultrasound and with some other activities, it is really beneficial to have somebody on the ground who is remotely guiding the crew through the activity that they are doing. Um, oftentimes it's not a physician. Um, being a remote guider is a skill in and of itself that has its own training plan and training development to make sure that they are able to talk to the crew precisely and give the crew exactly what they need to get the thing, to get the activity done. And again, language and word choice is critical here. So if it's an ultrasound activity, you know, the crew doesn't necessarily want to hear a lot of medical jargon. You know, they don't want to hear, you know, translate or long access. They want to hear, move the probe slightly down toward your feet, you know, two inches or move the cable into the probe up or down. Even just by saying move the cable into the probe up or down, you probably immediately had an image of your, in your mind of what I'm talking about. So our remote guiders are very skilled in using that language and being precise to help the crew get the image that they need or get through the activity they, that they need to get done in, the, in a timely fashion. Now, what is interesting is we have also found and have been told anecdotally that, believe it or not, it makes a big difference when those remote guiders actually smile when they're talking to the crew. The crew has told us, or a few crew members have said, they can tell when somebody's having a bad day. And it makes all the difference in the world when our remote guiders are actually smiling and enjoying what they're doing as they're helping the crew um, work through whatever telemedicine activity it is that they might be focused on right then. So this picture is actually a little bit old, but it shows a good typical setup of how we would do remote guidance there on the bottom. That is a back room in Mission Control. Uh, some remote guiders experts actually working with the crew to help get an image that they needed. So with the support of our ground teams and the procedures and the crew, we are really able to get good quality images with the ultrasound on board space station. Um, so that is really what I wanted to share about the ultrasound. Now we could have picked any piece of equipment that we have on board Space Station and talk through the same thing. I just was hoping by sort of picking one piece of equipment and walking through it like that, it would help to show you 
um, all of the things that need to be done and all of the things that go into the system to help make sure that we keep people healthy in space, that it's a much bigger picture than just the crew members themselves um, and a bottle of Tylenol, that there's a lot that goes into this. And even seemingly small things make a very big difference with the decisions we make and how we actually handle things um, pre-flight and in flight. And at the end of the day, everybody's goal is to help the crew be successful in what we're doing on board the space station. So that is, that is what we hope is the outcome. So what's next for us? There are a lot of really exciting future challenges on the horizon. Um, we've got a lot of great activities going on. And what's really exciting is to take what we've learned now in the 20 years of crewed operations on space station and figure out what's gonna work for longer duration missions. What isn't gonna work? What concepts of operations and what procedures and what activities do we need to start all over with how we think about them? What are the right requirements and how are we gonna get things done when again, say we are landing somebody years from now on Mars and there's not a greeting party there to get them. Are they gonna be able to get out? How do we prepare them for that? How do we fly enough food? So lots of really exciting challenges coming up. And I think I'd be happy to take any questions you might have. So this is, <clears throat> this is Michelle, where I get to applaud for everyone else, because I know they're all applauding, but you can't hear them, so I, thank you. And then I think it was really useful to, uh, to go through that um, ultrasound study. Um, I think that really helped a lot, even certainly helped me. Um, so we have a, we have a few questions. Um, what I'd like to do, if I can, is um, allow the participants to ask the questions themselves by unmuting them. And so uh, I'm going to start with uh, Bianca Behar. Um, now, Bianca's got a few questions. Bianca, what I'd like you to do, if you don't mind, is to ask your microorganism question. And then I'm going to go over to uh, a couple of other people and then come back to you for your other questions, if that's OK, just so that we're, we're um, sort of sharing the, sharing the time around a little bit, just like the, the astronauts have to do. So, uh, Bianca, I'm going to try and unmute you. I'm going to allow you to talk, so hopefully we can hear you now, Bianca. Please go ahead with your microorganism question. Uh, yes, uh, the microorganisms uh, reproduce in the space as fast as on Earth, or with the microgravity, it's different? Yeah, so that's actually a really good question, and we have an entire microbiology lab that looks at that. Um, so there are lots of things that change in spaceflight, both um, with microorganisms as well as things like immune response changes, even things like uh, medication absorption changes. So um, I don't want to give you a blanket answer, but I think it probably um, is, is might even be microbe dependent, but I know our microbiology lab has done a lot of uh, looking into that and a lot of research on that subject. Thank you. And now, uh, Jacob, um, Jacob Reif, I'm going to allow you to talk. Um, and I think I've given you permission. So if you would, if you'd like to ask your question, which is um, uh, the, the one you asked about uh, blood chemistry and so on. So please go ahead, Jacob. Yeah, this is actually Jacob's mom. So we are, uh, my name's Christina. Michelle, this is great. Um, Jacob is an aspiring owl and I'm his mom. and. Um, this is just great. I, I'm in the life sciences space, and so I don't want to take too much time, but I'm incredibly um, interested in how um, blood, you know, blood, semen, saliva, how any of that type of testing um, occurs up in space. And specifically, I'm, I'm just thinking about the microgravity, uh, the work that I do. I work at a commercial laboratory, a large commercial laboratory here in the U.S., and this is just fascinating. So if you could touch on that, and then anything you can share with us in terms of what platforms are actually up there um, in terms of the testing platforms. And then um, reference ranges. That was the other uh, question I had, and I appreciate you might not have the answer to this, but reference ranges I would think would be a little bit different um, considering the, the situation up there and the physiological changes uh, in all of us. But turning it back to you, and thanks for taking the question. This has been awesome. Well, great, and glad to hear that um, Jacob is interested in this. Would love to hear um, young folks getting involved and interested. Uh, so first of all, your reference question. So um, again, I'll go back to the fact that just like we don't expect the astronauts to memorize anything, I, what I tell our newer flight controllers is we don't expect you to have things memorized, but we expect you to know 
your resources and where to find the information. So I don't know it off the top of my head. Um, there have been um, lots of various attempts at labs on a chip to be able to fly to analyze some of the blood chemistry. Um, we are continually looking at new ones and better ways of monitoring that and um, testing that on orbit. So it's always one of the things that especially our immunology lab is always looking at is some of those lab on a chip functionalities to be able to replace some of the previous blood chemistry analyzers that we had. Um, so especially because uh, refrigeration challenge, it can be a bit challenging sometimes. So um, I can't off the top of my head give you the specific platforms that we're using, but um, would be happy to put you in touch with the right people. Thank you. And then um, we have a question uh, from a bioengineering major, um, Abby Parthasarathy. And so Abby, I'm going to let you speak to Michelle. You should be able to now. Please ask your question. Hi. I'm a bioengineering major who wants to work in the space medicine field in the future. Now, I'm just wondering what advice you'd give to a college student who wants to do this as a career and what I should do now. Yeah, great question. And thanks for asking, um, because I really do think it's an exciting time to be a part of the field. So my best recommendation to you, well, actually, I have two, is one is um, intern, see if you can intern in the summers um, or work in a lab, you know, in school where you are now. Those things are vital because you have some um, some real skills, but also some contacts. And that is the second is don't underestimate the value of those contacts that you make, especially if you intern, be it with a lab or with NASA or with us at KBR. We have interns in the summer. Generally, NASA has a very competitive intern program as well that you can apply for. Um, so that those would really be my biggest pieces of advice. Um, when we look at resumes of people coming out, those that have interns, um, internships on their resume, we just, we know that they have a little bit of work experience and we know that um, they've, they've been exposed to that environment. It makes a big difference. Abby, if you don't mind, can I ask you, are you, where, where are you studying? Are you at Rice or where are you? Yes, I'm at, I'm at Rice. So, um, so there is a center for space medicine at Baylor College of Medicine, and uh, we have an institutional agreement with them. So there may actually be certainly people over there to talk to, but there may also be classes that you can you can take, um, assuming you're, you're not swamped already. So that may be something that um, is worth looking into, and you can always, um, uh, if if you're if you're curious about that, you just uh, get in touch with me, and I'll I'll try and put you in touch with the right people. Great. Thanks. Thanks for the info. Okay. So um, let me go to, um, let me see. I think I can, um, there's, there's like three different screens. People are putting stuff in the chat in various places. Let me do, um, so there's an anonymous attendee, so I'm afraid I can't unmute them because I don't know who they are. Um, but they have asked, how are astronauts trained on instruments like a DNA sequencer doing such precision experiments? I know Kate Rubens was highly trained in this area with her background. So how are astronauts trained on, on instruments like DNA sequencers? Yeah, so in you know, in the in the case of Kate Rubens, that was her background. So she had that expertise coming in already. And it was actually a, a research activity that she really wanted to undertake while she was on the station. And so she she sort of brought that with her. Um, we don't typically train everybody on things like DNA sequencers. Um, but part of what we do also is look at um, how can we make the equipment more user friendly? How can we make it easier to use? Like you saw the the um, colorful overlay of the ultrasound keyboard. That was just one example. But looking at um, as equipment and devices get smaller and easier to use, that also really helps. So um, you know, in the in the case of Kate, it, she brought that expertise with her, essentially. Okay, thank you. Um, so then I'm going to go back to Bianca and then to Ted and then David. Those are the questions I have hanging at the moment. So uh, Bianca, I think I think you can still talk. Are you there? You may have to unmute yourself. I'm not sure how all this works. Uh, yes, I have. Um like technically four questions, um, but does the immune system change in microgravity? And immune can you, mm -hmm, your immune system. And if you can bleed to death when you're in microgravity, like you cut yourself, um, is it different? And um, like what type of experiments are done 
And the last question is how often uh, do you change or update the equipment? Because it has been 20 years, so do you use the same equipment or because it's so expensive to launch new equipment? Is it the same or, or you're updating it like every X amount of years? Yeah, so all really good questions. So I will try to take them in order. Uh, so we do see changes in immune function on orbit. And so in fact, we've had some, we've had crew members come home during the COVID-19 pandemic. And so we had to make sure that we were extra cautious with post-flight testing that we did with them, because typically as soon as the crew, the crew lands in Kazakhstan, we have a, a NASA aircraft there that picks them up and brings them home. So they are back in Houston generally within 24 hours. And part of that is so we can start doing some testing on them. But um, because of the changes in immune function, we had to be really careful about who had access to the crew until the flight surgeon had cleared them and was confident that their immune function had returned to normal. Um, Bleeding to death, well, the, again, sort of like my um, when I talked about the, the water that will just stay in a bubble, you know, if you were to gash your arm on something, you know, the, the, my understanding, again, not a physician and have not flown to the space station, um, is that the, the blood would sort of just pool up and, and bubble up right there. Um, and of course, we have bandages and things in the medical kit that we would use to take care of that. Um, and then... The other, the other question, what type of experiments are done? Um, I think that's a broad, broad general question. Yeah. And then, um, the last one was about replacing equipment because it's been there for, you know, some of them may have been there for 20 years. Right. Yeah. So some of the equipment is um, when we fly it, we know it's planned obsolescence. So we know, hey, we're going to replace this piece of equipment in, in six months or two years or five years or 10 years, um, either because we know that that's just the limited life. So we do limited life and life cycle testing on the equipment. You know, how many cycles can it handle before it needs to be replaced? So sometimes we just replace the whole unit with an identical unit. Sometimes we replace it by upgrading it to something newer or something better that has been developed. So it really depends on the piece of equipment and how long it is expected to last from a life cycle perspective um, is when we replace it. And as far as what experiments and research are, is being done on the space station, a, a lot. And the subject matter really varies. So I would encourage you to go out and look at the nasa.gov website. There is a lot of information out there about the research activities being done on the space station. And you can actually sign up for a, um, a weekly email that will send you an update as to what research activities were done that week. Great. And I, I would encourage everyone to go look there. So um, next up is uh, Ted Deshen. Ted, uh, you should be able to talk now. Uh, you had a question about telemedicine. Yes. Uh, hi. Uh, thanks, Michelle, for your presentation. So you spoke a lot about telemedicine, and I wonder uh, your thoughts on the lessons that have been learned from doing telemedicine on ISS and how that can be applied towards uh, missions that are going to be going out that are going to have different communication challenges. Yeah, that's a great question um, because, as you know, right now a lot of our concept of operations with telemedicine is being able to talk to the physician on the ground right away, um, and having or the remote guiders or the expert and having them guide you through that process. So I think um, my perspective is figuring out how do we take those lessons learned and translate them into autonomous mission operations procedure helps, right? So beyond just the procedure, but um, okay, so this is what the remote guider would normally be saying. How do we build that into the system so that it is automatically giving those cues to the crew member as they're doing that activity? Um, I think that's going to be really critical is those, um, those autonomous mission activities and, um, and autonomous uh, procedure uh, assistance. And then um, David Guajardo, uh, you had a question about the ISS uh, air content. So um, you're up now. I think you should be able to speak. Hi, hello. Thank you very much for your awesome presentation. My question, I have two questions actually. And the first one is, what type of air do they breathe in the ISS? Is it normal air, like 21% oxygen and 78% nitrogen? And the second question is, under my understanding is that for any EVA walk, they have to be breathing 100% oxygen for almost two hours before they open the hatch. So those are my two questions. Yeah, great questions. Thanks for those. So yeah, the space station, the majority the space station atmosphere is, is normal breathing gases. So it's what you and I are breathing right now. Yeah, so 21% oxygen, um, essentially. 
Um, and you're right. So where that changes is when we are getting ready to do an EVA or a spacewalk. And so the crew members do have to do what's called a pre-breathe protocol to be able to wash out some of the nitrogen out of their body to help prevent getting the bends. Because, um, well, first of all, when they get in their spacesuit to do a spacewalk, it is essentially a mini space vehicle they are getting in. Um, but the pressure of that spacesuit is only about four PSI. And so we have to make sure that they, um, that's why they breathe 100% oxygen is to uh, wash out all of the nitrogen out of their system so that when they get in the, that very reduced pressure of the um, EMU, the extravehicular mobility unit, that we can help prevent getting the bends. And actually our previous protocols have been very successful in preventing the bends. Incredible, thank you so much. Okay, thank you for that. Um, and we have two remaining questions, and um, I'm going to go back to I think it was Christine, maybe Christina, but Christine, um, can you unmute and then ask your question, um, which was related to COVID nineteen? Yeah, thank you. Um, it's Christina again, um, yeah. Michelle. This is fascinating. Uh, so, just one quick question. I know you talked a little bit about COVID nineteen, and I think you said there's some pre flight testing um, that goes on. And mm -hmm. I know that there's a new crew that's heading up there. Um, I, I can't imagine what that um, has brought in terms of the complexity of operations SOPs. Right. So you've got someone they're tested. They do the antigen testing but they're, uh, you know, the infancy of their infection, so they don't get picked up, worst case scenario. Now they're at ISS. So um, again, I mean, this is probably a three hour conversation, but can you just give us a high level idea of um, what new SOPs and procedures are now in place, um, especially considering we've got new folks going up there uh, in the very near future and we're right in the middle of a pandemic. So um, there's not a playbook on this, but I'm sure you're working on it. Thanks, Michelle. Yeah, great question again. Um, so we have something that we call the Health Stabilization Program. And that program, the whole um, intent of that program is to make sure that crew members aren't exposed to anything prior to launch. So for crew members launching on a Soyuz over out of um, Kazakhstan, the Russians are in charge of implementing their health stabilization program. But I can tell you that um, the medical community across all of the international partners on the space station work very well together. And so everybody is, is very aware of the regulations that the Russians put in place for health stabilization. For anybody launching out of the US um, here, the US is responsible for the health stabilization program. What was really interesting is we haven't launched anybody off US soil since um, the end of the shuttle program. And so we really had to reinvigorate our health stabilization program for the recent SpaceX launch, um, which then happened in the midst of COVID. So we were already revamping our health stabilization program to make sure we were taking care of and protecting crew members before they launched. And then we had to um, take it an extra step and make sure, oh goodness, are all of these measures good enough to protect against COVID as well? To launch, the number of people who have access to the crew that is launching is very limited. You have to have a reason to be near them. You have to have a physical exam. Um, they are basically in quarantine prior to launch. So. Thank you. Um, and I think we have one last question from, from Don. Don, I'm going to um, switch on your mic. So um, please go ahead, Don. Hi, Michelle. I'm wondering if you guys do any um, genetic testing on the uh, astronauts uh, prior to them heading into flight. Typically stuff that could complicate uh, life up on the um, uh, space station, such as genetic clotting disorders, line disorders, like the adds to uh, the increased incidence of uh, blood clotting and um, you know, visc increased viscosity of the blood during uh, that type of uh, setup? Yeah, so that that is a difficult question, um, but a very timely question. Um, so it is something that we are, are grappling with right now. There's a lot of benefits to looking at things like precision medicine that you can do from doing some of that genetic testing. But we also have to be very mindful that astronauts are employees. And so we have to make sure that we're following yeah. all the, the regulations so that we don't use anything that could potentially disqualify them from flying because of this. So um, there's lots and lots of discussion right now about how to 
how to do the best for the crew without um, unintentionally violating any of those regulations that are in place to protect people's employment as well. Um, so that is, um, it's been a hot topic for the last couple of years that has a lot of ethical considerations that we still are grappling with right now. Well, fantastic. So, um, you know, it's, we're, we've gone a while over because you've, you've answered so many questions. So, again, um, on behalf of everyone, Michelle, and particularly myself, I'd like to thank you for taking the time. I know everybody's busy these days and you've got things to prepare for since there's going to be six people up on station um, in not, not so uh, distant future. And then maybe when the crew one goes up, are you going to have nine people on station or something? Or how is that going to work? Um, you know, I, I should know that off the top of my head. I haven't looked at. Well, they exactly may be sending the four. They may be are... sending four. They may be sending four people up, so there may actually be ten people floating around there somewhere. So. So we do have cases where we will have periods of nine people on station, which causes a um, a significant logistical challenge with everybody using, especially the exercise hardware during those right. those very highly crude periods. They're they're pretty brief. Right. Yeah. Well, anyway, so it's exciting times and uh, yes. well, somebody's put something else into the Q&A, but I think we're sort of done unless it's a really, it's just basically people thanking you, I believe. Okay. Um, so, uh, so again, Michelle, thank you very much. Wonderful. Um, hopefully we'll see you soon in person on campus and uh, uh, I'll probably see you online at the ISMS, <laughs> which Sounds is coming good. up. And uh, yeah, great to talk to you. And thanks again. And everybody, thanks for joining us. Hopefully we'll see you Guy Fox night, November 5th. Bring your flames and torches and uh, enjoy the rest of your evening and stay safe. And Michelle, thank you again. Goodbye, thanks everybody. Thanks for having me. Yes.